Hello, good morning everybody, how are you? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and read our, our Bible verse today. It's gonna to be Esther 7, one through seven. So the king and Haman went to, went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your peti petition? It'll be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it'll be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been, destroyed, have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and, and annihilated. If we have merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he, where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, an adversary, an, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman realized that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Dear God in heaven, I just ask you just to be with Pastor Andrew today as, as he speaks the word, dear God, I ask you just to be with Zion City Church. I also ask for you just to be touching all the wives of Zion, or all the women of Zion City to join our women's conference next month, dear God, and I also ask you just to open our hearts and our minds to the word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Big hand. What are you called to do? This question is one that many of us, if not all of us, have wrestled with. And if we're honest, in the Christian community, has a particular kind of weight and pressure to it, right? In the Christian community, we use this language of called all the time, right? Are you called to this? Are you called to that? And people use this as a scapegoat to, do th to say no to things they don't want to do, right? Hey, do you want to join us for the men's thing? Oh, I totally would. I just don't feel called, right? It's because it's at 7 a.m., right? And we, we use this kind of language of called. But this begs the question, what does exactly it mean to be called to something? And where do we find this within the paradigm of the scriptures? For a lot of people, they feel this crisis of calling. They feel this internal angst of what am I supposed to do? Well, first and foremost, I think the scriptures speak that our calling is primarily a partnership. Here's what I mean. In the opening pages of the scriptures, it is clear that we were created with purpose. And the purpose for which we were created is to partner with God and what he's doing in the world. Right in those first few pages of Genesis, it tells us that we were created to rule with him, to be fruitful and to multiply. And we did a lot of that work on our For the, Ser for the City series. So if you want some more information on that, please go there. But it's this idea of that first and foremost, your calling in life is to partner with God and what he's doing with the world. Now, if you're anything like me, you're like, that sounds great, but what the heck does that mean? How on earth do I do that? Like, I, I know generally we know things like share the good news of the gospel and be a good neighbor and be generous. But like, what am I supposed to do nine to five every week? Or what am I supposed to give my life towards building? And to that, I would say this. The second key idea around calling is this. Your calling is unearthed. When we, all, when we ask little kids, what is the, the question that we ask them? We ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I love the answers that you get. Princess, astronaut, fireman, they're all great. The only thing that wrong with that question, I would say, is it's not always honest about the way in which the world works, right? Because just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. For example, when you would ask me if I was five years old what I wanted to be, I'd say probably an NBA basketball player. Looking at that was too quick of a laugh. 
looking at me. That was so hurtful. No, I'm just kidding. That's the point of the joke. It's clear that I probably wouldn't make the cut, right? For obvious reasons. Now, I could train really hard. I could get a really good vertical. But at the end of the day, I'm only this tall, you know? And so, though I could try. And look, there has been one player that's been in the height. I looked it up. There's been one player in the NBA that's been my height, right? But he could dunk, and that's not what I can do. But anyways... <laughs> it's even less likely for me to do something like that, right? And so as you get older, you realize there are things that you just can't do. For example, you may be somebody who's like incredibly introverted. So being a salesman or a saleswoman would be incredibly taxing for you. Yeah, theoretically, you could do the thing, but it'd be at the expense of your own sanity, right? At the expense, of, you would be drained after every single day. And so because you can do something, doesn't mean you should. It doesn't mean it's necessarily your calling. You see, our calling flows out of who we are, not just what we can do. And so the question is not what do you want to do, but rather what has God, or who has God rather, made you to be? You see, our calling is not chosen like the school that we go to or the person that we marry. It is unearthed, meaning we discover it by pulling back the dirt and seeing what God has placed within. Meaning that you don't go your whole life searching through all these things to figure out what you want to do, but instead to pay attention to your life and embrace your potential and your limitations. And so I think about a few people in the room this morning. I think of a young person who's being sent out into the world. And the world is their oyster. They have no idea what it is they're going to do, where it is their, their path is going to lead them. And today, I believe that this message is for you. I think of a person who finds himself in a season of transition. That for many years, maybe your calling was one thing, and it was clear, and it was certain. But now you're in a season of transition, and you're not too sure what this next chapter of your life will look like. And you wonder, what is my calling now that things have changed? I think of a person who has already figured out what they should do, but still find themselves, or hasn't figured out what they want to do, but still find themselves in the journey of discovery. If this is you, and you wrestle with this question, then brothers and sisters, I have good news. You're in good company. Here this morning in our study of Esther, we are seeing her step into her calling. Chapter 5 opens up with this. On the third day, Esther put on, a royal, put on her royal robes and stood in the, court, the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and he held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of his scepter. So recap, if you haven't been here. Um, Esther is an orphan in the middle of the Persian Empire, and she has suddenly risen to fame as she's been selected to be the queen over all of Persia. And so she is chosen as queen among thousands of women. And as she rises to this place, another thing happens simultaneously. Her uncle has a conflict with this man named Haman. Haman is one of the top military officials for the king, and Haman is being paraded through town celebrating his new successes, and Mordecai refuses to bow to him, and this stirs a conflict. And so Haman decides and determines in his heart that his goal is not just to take care of Mordecai, but he's actually going to take care of all the Jews as well. And so he makes a decree, he makes a plan to wipe out all of the Jewish people. So... This plot comes to Esther, and Esther's faced with the question, what am I going to do? And at first, in fear and in trepidation, she says she doesn't want to do anything about it, right? Because the request of her is that she would go before the king and plead for the lives of her people. But she knows that if she goes and does, and goes in the king's presence without his permission, she herself could be killed. And so Mordecai sends back word to her and says, look, if you don't choose to do this, Deliverance for the Jews will arise out of elsewhere. But he says, but who knows? Maybe this is why you've been called to your royal position. And so Esther in that moment makes a tough decision. And she says, she determines to step into the thing that God has placed before her. And she says those very famous words, if I perish, I perish. And she commits herself to liberate her people from the tyranny of this act. And so that's where we find Esther coming into chapter 5. And so we're going to go through 5, 6, and 7 today. 
So buckle up. It's going to be a fun road. Sorry about that. Alrighty. So Esther first embraces a life of integration. Esther has been living with a foot in both worlds, the world she lives in and the world she comes from. The world she lives in is Persia, a fast-paced secular world with sex, power, and parties dominating the scene. The world she is from is a world of faith, trust, and holiness. For majority of the story, we have seen Esther make the wrong decisions, but here, she makes the right one. She's chosen a life of integration. She no longer wants to live as one person in this world and one person in another, but instead, she wants to live an integrated life. J.D. Levinson says this, we see Esther the beauty queen giving way to Esther the true queen. Though she's far from perfect, Esther our character, she's at least becoming integrated. And I feel like this is a word for somebody in the room. The obstacle that you are discovering that's in the way of between you and your calling is this idea of integration. That the first step into you discovering who God has made you to be is living as a whole person. Not one person with these people over here and another person with these people over here, but living an integrated life, living a whole life, that you are the same person regardless of the rooms that you are in. That you live in the way in which God has uniquely created you, not curating your image to the people in the rooms that you find yourself in. And so we see this in Esther's life and that she wears the royal robes. The, this garment that she wore was specifically and only made for the queen. And when she wore these, it was clear that she was stepping into her authoritative position as queen. Um, most of our professions have uniforms. This is Esther's, these royal robes. And so for her, this is an embodied way of her saying, this is, what, this is who I've been called to be and I'm stepping into this position. Next, Esther embraces a life of consequence. Remembers Esther, Esther's line, if I perish, I perish. When Mordecai first presents Esther with the crisis, she doesn't want to play her part in the matter because no, she knows that it would be putting her life at risk. Esther could have snuck by, lied about her heritage, been safe in the palace of the king, and although Mordecai warns her that ultimately she wouldn't be safe, uh, she still, this temptation is still in the back of her mind. But what it really comes down to is what kind of life did Esther want to lead? A life of comfort or a life of consequence? You see, deep down, each one of us longs to live a life of consequence. But too often, we make our decisions based on comfort. Right? All of us have this desire to want to lead a life that matters. Lead a life that would leave behind a legacy of faith and trust and goodness but all of our daily decisions say, I want comfort instead, right? Netflix is super addicting. There's a super good show. Or I'm watching The Bear on Hulu or whatever it is, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going deep in on all of these different things. And, 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 and finding myself to step out of those things is just so hard because it's just so comfortable. Yes, I want to live a life marked by generosity. But at the same time, we really like eating takeout, Right? Yes, I, I really want to be a person who is present and available for others, but man, people really get on my nerves, or whatever it is, right? And we find these things waging war within us, but listen and hear this, to live a life of consequence always requires sacrifice. Nobody who ever did anything that had any sort of meaning or mattering in the end did it with ease. It all came with great sacrifice. And this is what Esther has come to realize, that her life requires sacrifice. Next, she embraces a life of leadership. Again, remember the royal robes. This was her functionally positioning herself as queen. And notice, she stands in the presence of the king. She does not bow. She does not fall before him. But if you were coming to give the king a petition or request, you would fall before him as, as, as a way of saying, I'm fully submitted unto you. I'm, I'm in desperate need of your grace. But instead, she stands within the inner court, realizing that she, fully embracing the reality that she is queen as, as Xerxes' counterpart. Joyce Baldwin says this, 
Her royal robes demonstrated that she approached the king with one as privileged status as the king's consort. She presented herself, albeit with due deference, as the king's counterpart. Esther realized she must use the resources entrusted to her. And this is fundamentally what leadership is about. It is realizing the resources that have been entrusted to you and using them to bring the good out of others. Esther realizes the burden that's placed before her, and she utilizes all the resources that have been given to her as queen to leverage for the good. And so, what if discovering your calling is not about some far-off event or status, the thing that you're waiting for around the corner, but hear me in this. What if you've already been given everything that you need? What if already it is in your hand that which you need to step into the thing that God has for you? That stepping into the call of leadership is not just waiting until you have the perfect situation to lead, but rather it's learning how to lead where you find yourself. And I feel like many people are waiting for something to confirm their calling, right? They're waiting for just this Cheerios to line up just so perfectly to tell me where to go. Or they're playing newspaper roulette and they're flipping it open and pointing and hoping that it would give them some sort of direction. Fastly racing through the radio stations to see if somebody will say something. You're waiting for a sign and it's already been given to you. It's already been placed in your heart and placed in your hand. You're just not paying attention. Esther also embrace a life of risk. Notice, she goes before the king. She puts her life on the line. Remember the king's rule, if anyone would go in her presence, in his presence uninvited, it would be met with death. And we realized one thing in the story, and that's this. Xerxes is not reasonable, right? This case, he's not super thoughtful and patient and kind, and maybe there's a good reason he's reactionary. He's drunk half the time, right? He's volatile. He's, 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 he's like a volcano, ready to explode at any moment. And it could have been the wrong moment for Esther, but it wasn't. It wasn't until the king reached out his scepter that Esther knew her fate, that the king was delighted to see her. You see, in ancient times, the reaching out of the scepter was a symbol that, I am pleased that you're here. Come and speak with me. And so in doing that very act, he's saying, you're permitted to be here. And it wasn't until he reached out the scepter that Esther knew that. Esther walked in that room willing to lay down her life, even if it didn't work out. And so what if discovering your calling is on the other side of risk? What if right now you've been playing it safe and and making calculated moves and doing all these things just so you could have all your outcomes line up together, but the very things that God is calling you to do requires risk. John Wimber has a famous saying. He says, faith is spelled R-I-S-K, and I love that. John Tyson says this, risk unleashes worlds of possibility and even paves the way for other people's destiny." The willingness to step out and to risk is what opens the doorways for brand new possibilities. And Esther realizes that. The story continues. Verse 3, then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, and it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to a banquet Esther already had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom and it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition request is this. If the king regards with me any favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. So, Esther goes before the king, and she's like, uh, it's clear that she needs something best on her royal, royal, royal robes and how she comes into him, and he's like, what is it you want? And the king's very boastful. Up to half the kingdom, everything is yours, right? Whatever you want. And her request is simple. Hey, I threw a party for you guys. Would you guys want to come and do that? Oh, and invite Haman. And this is her request. And she says, and there at this party, I'll reveal my request to you. And the king, being who he is, ain't going to say no to a party, right? Now, notice one thing. Esther already had the party prepared. She already went in 
with all the things in order and in place as if the plan was already going to go through. She wasn't surprised when the king said yes and was like, oh, I got to get things ready for this party. She already had everything set out. The tableware, the drinks, everything was already prepared. She was fully ready for what was to come. Next, notice she invites Haman to the party. Now, this seems like a peculiar decision. Why would you bring the very person who is en route to mass murder you and all of your people? You'll see Esther's wisdom here shortly. But she strategically invites Haman, and she wants her enemy at the table. Why? Michael Fox says this. Esther's deliberate inclusion of Haman shows she has a well-designed plan. She realizes she must defeat him quickly and must certainly prevent him from parlaying with the, with the kind and others, with the king rather, and others behind her back. So here, Esther realizes how dangerous Haman can be around the king. And if she discloses this plan to the king alone, there's a strong likelihood, like the rest of the story, he will consult his counsel. That with whom Haman is a part of. And Haman would have an opportunity to spin the narrative, to make it what he needed to be. So Esther here is using divine strategy. Now here's what's important. So far in the story, Esther has just done whatever she is told in the very beginning. She just follows Mordecai's instructions. She follows Xerxes' instructions. She's at the whim of everybody else. But here we see Esther really begin to step into her own. And it's at that moment where she realizes that it's her life on the line. Remember her response back to Mordecai. Mordecai says, you need to go and talk to the king. Esther begins to plan things and make things in her own way when she says, you all need to, feed, you all need to fast for me and pray. Now, she didn't ask Mordecai for this. She commands Mordecai. She says, you need to get all of the people together and you need to fast. We see her begin to step in this mantle of leadership. Second, she doesn't just follow Mordecai's plan blind, just go and talk to the king and tell him everything. She devises a plan of her own, using the wisdom and the information that she has in relationship to the king and how he would respond, how he act, how Haman is, how he would respond, and the tools and resources which God has given her. There is this phrase all throughout the book that Esther is constantly gaining favor. And we talked about this, that it's not passive in nature, meaning that she just happened to stumble upon favor, but it's this duality of both grace and gift. It is both God at work giving her favor and Esther's natural God-given abilities that she's curing favor with other people. It is both and happening at this time. And Esther leans onto her strength and gaining favor, incurring favor with others in this conversation with the king. And so she devises this strategy. Now, it seems like a weird thing for Esther to do to be like, I have a big ask. What is it? Come to my party and then I'll tell you. So he comes to the party. He has a couple of glasses of wine. He's eating some pork chops or whatever. He's feeling good. And he's like, oh, yes, why we're all here. Esther, tell us what your request is. Anything you want up to half the kingdom. And she's like, I'll tell you if you come to a second party, right? And so it's like, what's going on here? Why are all these parties? Like, it, it, it seems strange that she's doing this, but a couple of things are happening here. One, she's trying to pique the interest of the king into her situation. She does not want her to request to be one of thousands that he gets in that day. She wants hers to stand above the rest, right? We've all experienced this. Someone starts telling you a story and then says, ah, I better not say and now you're like, well, dude, we're already halfway in. You better fess up and tell me, right? And they're like, no, no, I really shouldn't. You know, whatever. Dude, we're this far. You've already committed the crime. Just tell me what it is, right? Because they have your interests piqued. And if they're like, oh, no, whatever, the whole drive, you're like, how was it going to end? What was going to happen? Whatever. You'd be spinning all over the place. And this is exactly the technique Esther uses to pique the king's interest. What on earth does she want? Like, it's got to be a big request if there's two parties preceding it, you know? What is this big request she has? She wants her request to stand above the rest. Second, she's also trying to get the king to commit to saying yes to whatever it is before he even knows what it is. In him coming to the second party, it is the king basically saying yes to whatever it is that you're asking for. She says, if I found favor with you, come to my party and fulfill my request. In his attendance, he's saying, I've already signed the blank check. Just tell me what it is. 
Um, Michael V. Fox says this, Esther is making the king virtually commit himself in advance, signifying by his presence at the sacred banquet that he has already granted her wish. We see here, Esther is using an incredible amount of wisdom. She's not shooting from the hip. She's not going in guns blazing. She's using great wisdom and tact. Now remember the point of this book. God isn't mentioned once, and here's why. We are to do our very best to consider what Michael Fox says is a theology of possibility, where we survey through this book to look for the fingerprints of God and where he's at in this moment. And it is here that I would contend we see some of his fingerprints most clearly, and that Esther is operating in wisdom. The biblical authors are clear that the way God made the world was through wisdom, that God has woven wisdom into the fabric of the universe, and that when human beings tap into that wisdom, they walk in accordance with the way God would have them live. Read the book of Proverbs. And so Esther becomes this archetype for wisdom. Now, is Esther perfect in the story? No. But here, in this moment, she makes the right decisions. She uses this wisdom that I would argue is from above. The story continues, verse 9. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she also invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all of this gives me no satisfaction. As long as, I can see that, as long as I can see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and his friend said to him, Have a pole set up reaching a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. So, Haman's leaving the party. He's had a couple of drinks in him. He's feeling high and clowning out. I got invited to this very elite party. And he's walking out, and he sees Haman, or he sees Mordecai. Now, Haman and Mordecai are like, it's like the Western duel. You know what I mean? It's, they're looking at each other across the courtyard. And Haman has played his cards. He says, you want to disrespect me? I'll not only wipe you out, but all of your people. And so what is he expecting Mordecai to do? come and beg for his life, look terrified of him, be in awe of his power, but Mordecai doesn't. He just stands looking at him, doesn't bow, doesn't show any fear, you know, doesn't even wince, you know what I'm saying? Like the Western, you know what I mean? They're just looking at each other. And this fills Haman with rage because he realized his plot's not working. Because what Haman really wants at the end of the day is Mordecai's respect and fear, and he does not get it. And this drives him insane. And so he goes home in a huff, you know? Kicks open the door. There's dinner on the table. He's frustrated. I can't believe this guy, Mordecai, is already going off with his wife, right? And he begins to boast about all this stuff. Look at how much wealth that I have. Look at this nice couch you're sitting on. Look at all these kids that we have. He starts going on everything. He says, not only that. He says, I get invited to all these illustrious parties. So he is just bragging and boasting, showing his insecurity that Mordecai has exploited the reality that Haman can't get control of just anybody he wants. And this has been his life thus far. With power and wealth and authority, he's been able to will people to do what he wants them to do except for Mordecai. And this drives him insane. And so like we see as a theme throughout this book, he goes to advisors and asks for their help. He asks his friends and his wife, what should I do about Mordecai? And they devise this plan that they're going to have him impaled. They say that it's uh, 50 cubits high would be the equivalent of 75 feet in the air, right? The author is writing with intention of this exaggerative amount, 75 feet high. That's seven and a half stories high of a stake. I'm not even sure how you'd get wood to come together that high or whatever it would be, right? But this is what the, biblical, this is what the authors are saying here. And they plan to have him killed. And so... First, he's losing control, and he feels that. 
And so what does he do when he feels he's losing control? He grasps, grasps for something quick. He grasps for something quick that he knows that he can control. If I can't get him to bow to me, then I will end his life. And he commits to doing that. Now, when we read biblical stories, we like to think that we're the heroes of the story. You know what I'm saying? It's like in this story, we're Esther and Mordecai, the fearless ones who stand up against, take that, right? We're Moses. We're the ones at the sea seeing the split sit because we believe in God, right? We're David taking on Goliath. But if we're really super honest, we find ourselves not identifying with the good characters of the scriptures, but honestly, we see ourselves often in the bad ones. How many times have you felt that you were losing control and you made a rash decision to grasp for power. You feel like things were slipping out of control, and so in a hasty move, you do something to kind of feel the sense of, I have control over something. This is exactly what Haman does. And even when John talked about last week, it really shouldn't bother Haman that Mordecai doesn't bow. He's one among hundreds of thousands of people in the Persian government and in the Persian world. And all of them bowed and showed respect and chanted his name as he was paraded on the streets and had the banners, go Haman, or whatever. But he only notices the one hater, right? And he fixates on him. And he focuses on him. And he does, he gears all of his life towards overcoming him. How many of you are wasting so much energy and emotional bandwidth and time focusing on the opinions of people who don't matter. We are Haman. Remember what John pointed out last week, that Haman's name means a man filled with wrath? How many of you are making rash decisions in anger because you feel that things are out of control? I would love to read this and say, I'm Mordecai, right? Or I'm Esther. But I find bits of Haman in me. And this is the invitation of the biblical authors to realize the foolishness of our ways. Now, if Esther and Mordecai are a picture of wisdom, Haman's a picture of a fool. Notice what the Proverbs say in Proverbs 18, 12. It says this, Before a downfall, the heart is haughty or proud or thinks highly of itself. But humility comes before honor. There's also the famous proverb, uh, before the fall comes pride, right? Pride comes before the fall. And we see this in Haman. He's proud. His insecurities are being highlighted. He's making these rash decisions. The story continues. Verse 6. That night, the king could not, oh, sorry, verse 1, chapter 6. That night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. So here's what the, bib the biblical authors are doing here. This whole thing's happening with Haman. He's plotting this. He erects the pole. He's ready to have Mordecai killed. At the exact same time, we get a peek into what's happening in the king's, in the king's room. He can't sleep. He's tossing and turning, whatever. And so like you might do, click on the TV, turn on something boring so you could fall asleep. He does, but instead, he has a book read to him. Come read me a book. Now what's really funny, and kind of shows the king's ego, is he has his own stories read back to him about his own kingdom. Like, that's a different level of narcissist, right? I need to fall asleep, come tell me how awesome I've been these last few years, right? And they come and, oh, you did this and you did that. Man, I'm so cool, right? That's how he falls to sleep. That's a different level of narcissism, you know? But this is what happens, and, and it just so happens that he can't sleep. And it just so happens that the book he once read is not the Berenstein Bears or, you know, Bluey Goes Here, but instead it's his own story. And it just so happens as the guy, you know, turns to the page, it's the story of Mordecai saving the king's life from the plot to assassinate him. So there's all these, it just so happens. And again here we see a theology of possibility. That God is in the inner workings of what's happening here. His influence is found. And so he, re he reads that story. Verse 3. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court from the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole that he had set up for him. 
His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. And when Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man who, delights, who the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So, the king answered, so he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden and one with the royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes let the robe the man the king let the sorry let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on horse through the city streets proclaiming before him this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor so the king hears the story and he's like wait 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 did we do something for that guy did we send him a gift basket or something you know and they're like no he didn't do anything he's like man we got to do something for him uh, who's here who's in the office that can help me and just at that moment, it just so happens that Haman's, you know, he's walking in. He's ready to, he's ready to ask. He's got the pole set up. Mordecai is going to die today. You know, it's like that cliche moment in the movies. There's a Phil Collins song playing. He's walking with his briefcase on to work. Today is going to be a good day. Birds are chirping. He's got his latte in his hand, right? Nothing bit bad is going to go on here. And he walks into work, and the first thing is, ah, oh, Haman, the king's looking for you. He's requested your presence. Ah, oh, he likes to do that in the mornings. I'll be right up, you know. And he gets up there, and he shows before the king, and the king's like, Haman, we have somebody we need to honor. What should we do? And Haman thinks to himself, who else could it be but me, right? So this day can't get any better. Going to kill my enemy, and on top of that, get a little kudos from the king. You know what I'm saying? And so Haman here gets grandiose. He's not just like an Amazon gift card will do. He's like, we're doing the whole shebang. He's all, I want some of your threads, right? I want your nicest horse. I don't want just your nicest horse, but I want your horse with bling on it, you know, the spinners and everything. He's got the royal thing encrusted on it, right? And I want to have a parade. Now, not just any normal parade where, like, everyone would just, like, cheer and shout, but I want them all to have a theme song for me when I walk through, saying, this is what happens to the person who the king wants to honor. What do you think, right? This is all his planning and his scheming. Now, here's what's important to notice. It seems that Haman's request is quite peculiar in that he's asking for all of the king's things. Notice this. This is what Adele Berlin says. She says, instead of fine linen robes, he wants the king's own robe. Instead of riding in the viceroy's chariot, he wants the king's own horse. And instead of the obscure exclamation of whatever the people would be shouting, right, Haman wants a long and clear proclamation of his honor. It seems that Haman wants the king's position. He wants the king's life. And not just his life, his threads, his horse, the whole thing. He wants to essentially be like the king. He wants to be like Xerxes. Now, the story continues. Go at once, the king commanded. Get the robe and the horse, and do of you just suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything that you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what the king has done for the man the king delights to honor. And after Mordecai returned to the king's gate, after Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. And he told Jeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And his advisor and his wife said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuch arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. So he plans this grandiose celebration. And the king's all, I love it. You never believe who we're going to honor. Mordecai. And just you could see the dread just fill in his eyes as he realizes what's about to happen. And he says, hey, go do everything you recommended. And listen, don't forget a single detail. I loved it. I want to see that happen. And so there Mordecai is, getting the horse, putting the bling on the horse, getting the ro Haman, putting the robe on Mordecai, having Mordecai. And it's not just that it happened. What's even worse is he has to lead him through the city. As he's going around, everyone's cheering, Mordecai's amazing, he's the best. They got all the posters and signs. And remember that song he wanted to be sung? He's the one who has to sing it for him. This is what the king does for the people he wants to bless, you know. And he's doing that all throughout town. 
So that morning, he thinks, I'm going to kill him. And that evening, he's leading him through town as people are praising his name. So the second the event is over, Haman rushes home with his face covered. He is humiliated. He is filled with grief. He comes home. I had the worst day, right? He's ready to pour out. And the very people who advised him to do the very thing that he did and erect the pole are now like, oh, dude, you're out of luck, bro. You know, you're, you're, you're done for. This is the downward spiral. This is the end. What kind of wife is that, right? Like, that's the end, but sorry. You know, we, we signed all the documentation, the will, everything's in my name. So this is the end of your road. It, it seems harsh, but after being humiliated, the this, this story continues. And this, before he even has time to process the hurt and anguish, the knock comes at the door. Hey, Esther is ready for you to come to the party. I can't deal with this right now. I have to go. Runs out the door. The story continues. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet, and they were drinking wine on the second day, and the king asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? And it will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, and it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you to grant me my life, this is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If I had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify to serving the king. But King Xerxes asked Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, An adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage and, rage and left his wine and went out into the, place, into, the garden, into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in this house? And as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbana, one of the king's eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to the height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole, set up for Mordecai, and the king's fury subsided. So Haman comes to this dinner, and Esther reveals the plot. There is a person for whom has bought favor with the king, and in doing so has bought me and all my people, and not just bought us, but has condemned us to death. Remember Haman's early conversation with the king. Haman was going to exp spend an exuberant amount of money in exchange for this decree to come to pass. And so, in so many words, he's buying these people and sentencing them to death. And Esther says, this is me. Remember, this whole time, has Esther has kept her heritage a very secret until this moment, where she discloses to the king, king who she is and who her people are. And the king is furious livid. Now, one of the interesting things that I think happens here is that uh, Esther's request about, like, if it was just slavery, it wouldn't be a big deal. It sounds really peculiar and strange, but here's what Esther is saying. What Esther is trying to do is frame the situation that the person who's exploiting these things is actually grasping for the king's power. And in doing so, uh, one of the things that they would work in those days is, is people of wealth or prominence or power would exchange slaves and people and property and horses and all these different things as a way to show that they're kind of uh, peers, equals of sorts almost, because they have power and wealth, I have power and wealth, and we'll just exchange these different things. And so what she's basically saying to the king in so many words is somebody is coming for your throne. She said, it wouldn't be a big deal if it was just slavery, but they're coming to annihilate the queen that you have married. They're coming for your spot. Now remember, a couple of things are coming to the king's mind right now as he's thinking about this. First, as all the other stuff that's been weird about Haman, wanting the very things the king has, right? He's wanting the king's robe, the king's horse, the king's this, and then all of a sudden now there's a plot being revealed that he actually wants his bride. And this infuriates the king. And he can't even be in that moment for long. He storms out. Now, the second thing that we see happening is as the king's out in the palace, he needs to find a reason to justify getting rid of Haman since the king's the one who signed off on the decree. 
right? Effectively, the king is the one who is giving authority for his wife to be murdered. So he needs to find a way around this to where Haman can be the scapegoat and he washes his hands clean. Because remember that anytime the king writes anything into law or order, it can't be undone. So this is all happening. And so in a fury, he comes back into the room and he sees Haman laid out on Esther's couch. Now, this was a big cultural no-no, right? You don't get anywhere near the king's wife. It would be like you wanting to go hug the first lady really close. It's like Secret Service can take care of you real quick, right? You're not just going to get that close to her. It was even more so in these ancient days. And so as the king comes in, he sees Haman like pleading at the feet of Esther. Now, do we really think he was like trying to make a move on her? No. But think about all these things already in the back of the king's mind as he walks in the room. And it's been confirmed, and now the king has a reason to get rid of him because he committed an, uh, 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 an, un an unredeemable offense. And that it seems like he made a move for the queen. Now, what happens next is a literary motif called the death by irony. That Haman set up this pole to have Mordecai impaled, and it is he himself that is impaled on that pole. And this is a great theme throughout this book. It's this idea of divine reversals. That there's one thing happening in this moment, and then just as time goes by, it turns on its head and it flips, and it goes the other way around. Now, what does this have to do with us in the modern world? Well, I think it actually speaks to a brilliant reality. One of the questions that we've been asking in this series is, how does God work in the world? I feel like many of us, are always waiting for Red Sea moments, right? These miraculous encounter moments and stuff like that, and they happen. God does do that. But a majority of the time, it looks like this. It looks kind of chaotic and just so happens and circumstance and, and happen chance and all these different things that feel all like coincidence when it's actually God working behind the scenes. And this raises a larger question. How does God deal with evil? I think the scriptures would contend that the way that God deals with evil is he turns evil in over on itself. That he allows evil to run its course on itself. The greatest example of this is the cross. Paul, in his reflection on this in Colossians, says that the, the, the powers that be exerted all of their energy in killing Jesus, and they thought that in killing Jesus, the plans of God would be thwarted, but they did not realize they were actually playing into his hand. It was exactly what he wanted them to do. And so in exhausting all of their power, all of their influence, all of, their, all, all of the things that they had been given, they thought they had defeated the Son of God, but they actually played right into his plan. And three days later, Jesus overcame, triumphed over his enemies by way of the cross. The way that God deals with evil is he allows evil to run its course and destroy itself. It implodes from the inside out. And we see this in Haman. Because had Haman never cared about what Mordecai did or thought, he would never be in this place. And because of insecurity, his pride, and his ego, he was willing to bring death upon a whole group of people. But instead, he finds himself as the one who loses his life. The same king that he used to manipulate to bring about his own purposes is the same king who, who decreed his death, a divine reversal. Now, back to this idea of calling. When we read the story of Esther, it can feel like, well, dude, it's clear for her, like, no one's asking me to be queen of the United States or something, and there's not these plot to kill all these people that's laid before me. It's like, dude, I'm an accountant, you know? Like, I, I don't have this life and death tragedy, you know? It's numbers, or it's I'm dealing with toddlers or something of that nature. Like, where does this land for me? Like, it seems like Esther's thing has fallen into her lap, and I feel like I'm grasping at straws at what I am supposed to do. And I would say this. Esther was just faithful with what was right before her. Now, I want to give some pastoral encouragement in terms of how to unearth your calling as we close. And there's three questions I want you to ask yourself. It's this. What's in my heart? What's in my hands? And what am I hearing? What's in my heart? What's in my hands? And what am I hearing? The first idea is this. What do you love? What gets you up in the morning? What are you excited about? What are you passionate about? 
It is most often that that is the place where God speaks to us about the areas that he wants to use us in life. What are you passionate about? What, what gets you excited? What do you love? And the second thing is, does what you love bring forth goodness? As God would say, it's good. Right? If what you love is binge-watching Netflix, you know, I'm not going to really say that that's like bringing the kingdom come or something of that nature. You know what I'm saying? But what do you love that could actually make a difference and bring goodness into the world? It is those two things that I want to ask you the question, what's in your heart? The next question is this, what's in your hands? What are you good at? And don't be like, oh, I can't do nothing good. Everybody here has gifts and talents and things they bring to the table, right? That whole, I don't do anything good is actually false humility, right? It's like, well, what are you good at? Nothing, I'm just the worst, so that people could say, no, you're not, you're the best, really, you mean it, you know? No, really, what are you good at? What are the things that God has uniquely created you that you're good at, that come to you relatively feeling like effortlessly? And the second question to that is what opportunities do you have? What are the doors that are open right before you? Maybe it's not the dream all the way down the line, but maybe it starts somewhere. It starts with something small, it's much as this little opportunity to help or to serve or to be a part of something or to help somebody with something or to just start dabbling in something, and that opportunity will birth and grow. As you're faithful with small things, it will expand and grow and become something. And lastly, what are you hearing? What is something the world needs right now? One of the ways I often see callings come to life is there'll be somebody who's in a lot of different moments and hears from a lot of different people a need come forth, that they have the gifting and grace to help fill that need. And it's multiple people, multiple conversations, and they hear that thing. The second thing is, what is the Spirit saying to you? As you pray, as you contend, as you ask, do you feel the Spirit drawing and prompting you anywhere else? And lastly, what is my community saying? What are the people around you? Like if I came to our leadership and said, guys, I'm quitting the pastorate, I'm going to the NBA. My hope and prayer is that everyone would halt me in my tracks, right? Because they love and care about me. Like, dude, we love you, bro. It's not going to happen, right? That ship has sailed. But that if I came and shared them with, about other dreams in my heart that align with my calling, that align with my gifting, they would affirm those things and speak life over these things and give me great wisdom and guidance. And lastly, just a word on here, is take the pressure off. I feel like we put all this weight to have to like make a decision and then when we make the decision, it has to work out perfectly the exact way that we thought it. If you were to ask me when I was 16 if I'd be pastoring a church in New Mexico in Los Unidos, New Mexico, the place that I grew up, I wouldn't have believed you for a second. Yet here we are. And so if I'd put all this pressure and weight to have everything figured out when I was that age and or even 19, I would have crushed underneath that pressure. But you're just faithful with the things that are in your heart that are in your hands, and the things that you're hearing. And then before you know it, you wake up, and you're here. And you're doing the thing. You're doing the thing that God has made you to do, is you've just been faithful with the things that are before you, and the things that he's placed in your heart, the things that he's placed in your hand, and the things that you're hearing from the community and the spirit around you. And then one day, you just wake up and you realize, I'm living out my calling. And then it maybe come packaged the way that I thought, and maybe not look the way that I had planned, but here I am, and God is blessing and moving me.